Uh, welcome to this session. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Mergen Yuzlak. I run global business development for ePages, which some of you may know, others not. Um, all right. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, the world of e-commerce in the perspective of uh, small businesses, because a lot of the discussion around e-commerce as you walk around is uh, revolves around the, the big guys. The, the Amazons of the world. And we are a service provider for uh, small businesses. So we are a practitioner. We're not an academic institution. So we're, you know, don't expect too many hard facts. What we want to do today is give you some insights uh, based on our experience of working with these small retailers, which I assume there's quite a few of you in the audience, and um, to share some of them to see why they're unique, um, what are their characteristics, what makes them tick, what are their motivators, and uh, how we, all of us in the sort of larger uh, e-commerce ecosystem can support them in their mission. So I hope you enjoy this and find it useful. So about us, uh, one slide about the company. Sorry. So this is a nice statement by our CEO. This is basically um, our mission statement. We're there to, to support the, um, the small merchants. So a couple of facts. I'm going to play all of them. So ePages has been around for about 20 years. Um, we are a, um, a software company at, at the core. Uh, we have a product, and that product is an online shop platform for small and mid-sized businesses. And uh, that's all we do. And we have 160 employees in all of these offices, um, four countries. Um, and what's unique about um, our business model, so we're an online shop platform. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a cloud, a fully, um, um, a full cloud solution software as a service. What is unique about uh, our business model is um, this part here is the way we go to market. So that is why a lot of you may not have heard of ePages because most of these 140,000 customers in the market, small business owners that use our shops, have bought their shop from some of these guys, Strato, one and one in Germany, with Deutsche Telekom, so we're mostly on a private label model. Um, we operate in, uh, in most European countries, US and uh, Australia. So, so this is um, who we're gonna be talking about today. It's uh, Christiana is one of, one of our customers and um, she's a, a nice example because she embodies all of these characteristics that we've identified across the board in our customer base. Um, so uh, we're going to get into some of these examples today. So um, what is, for example, what's unique about uh, Christiana in her shop? So she's from Berlin. Uh, that's why we picked her for today. And um, she started with, uh, as a pure online player with an online shop. And then she, as the business grew, she sort of did the reverse multi-channel, you know, starting um, opening up physical shops. And uh, what's unique here is the type of business she's in. So she's a fashion designer, and uh, she's very passionate about dance because she, uh, that runs in her family. So she makes um, custom dresses for tango and salsa. And she sells them in the shop. So we're going to get into that a little bit more later. All right, so now the, a couple of facts, just because it's an official presentation, so you need to have some numbers. Um, these, are, these numbers are not surprising to you. You've seen them all before. I'm just using that, this as a stimulus for discussion. These are global numbers, the global e-commerce market. Obviously, you know, trillions of, uh, a few trillion dollars. Very, uh, very big market. And what's important here is that it's growing. So the prediction by uh, eMarketer in 2016 was that the market's going to double in these four years till 2019. The next slide. Oop. All right. So zooming in on Germany, um, these numbers you, I'm, I'm also assuming you're familiar with, 12% growth in e-commerce revenue in, um, in 2015. So the point here is that it's a big market and it's still growing, even though 12% is not as much as it used to grow in the past. The, but it's still healthy growth given the, the base that it's starting from. Now, you know, uh, a lot, as I said in the beginning, a lot of the discussion about e-commerce in general is uh, around the big guys, the Amazons of the world. These are the top um, top ten in Germany, 
And uh, the question now is how much of this um, overall e-commerce market um, is sort of dominated or uh, what, what's the contribution of the small businesses in this larger piece of the pie? So um, arguably, and uh, you know, preparing this presentation, it was very difficult to get the actual numbers. So if anybody knows the numbers, the market share of SMBs in any of these markets, please let me know after the presentation. I'd love to hear it. But there's some sort of proxies, uh, some indicators of what that might be, which is on this slide. So if you look at a couple of interesting facts that we, um, that we came across, the Amazon number here. Um, so these are global numbers uh, for the entire Amazon business. And um, if you look, so Amazon claims that 45% of all of their, not revenue, but units sold are sold via their marketplace. And by extension, that means that it was sold by small and mid-sized businesses. So if you think about that, Amazon in all the countries that they're in are probably, if not the largest players, some of the top two, three players. Um, and if you combine this with um, these numbers from eBay, uh, this is eBay Germany, by the way, uh, where they say that uh, the merchants, marketplace merchants, have grown on average 20% each year the last five years. So if you combine these two facts, um, you, you can see that it's a, it's, a, it's a big share of the market and that it's a steadily growing one. So that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Now, oops, wrong device. So zooming in on uh, some numbers, so these are ePages numbers. So these, this is something we published a few, uh, few months ago. Um, these numbers here, uh, so we, we looked into our database of, of, of customers. So we have 140,000 uh, paying customers. And we looked at a representative sample of about 4,000 of them in these countries. And uh, we looked at, focused on the ones that were active in 2014 and 2015 and that were representative of this larger picture. And we came to the conclusion that in 2015, uh, the ePages merchants, for example, in Germany, grew their revenue through an ePages shop by 18%. Now, what does that mean? So, by the way, this is not including the other channels because we, you know, the, the physical shop because we don't, we don't track that, obviously. But th what this means is that if you compare this to the previous slide with the 12% average growth of e-commerce in Germany, uh, this is slightly above. And if you look at the other uh, countries like Spain and France with uh, 10 and 11%, um, uh, percent, it's very much in line with this growth which also confirms, um, if you look at this 18%, it also confirms the, the eBay numbers from a completely different perspective. Uh, Italy and, and Switzerland are a little higher because they're um, sort of less mature markets for, for us, for ePages, so they're not as representative um, as the other three, I would say. This is another uh, case study. You can take a look at them. Um, you can take a look at their website. It's, it's an ePages shop. And I picked them here because, uh, because of this quote where they say, well, with this technology, uh, whatever it is, and in this case, it's, it's e-pages, it could be something else, it's, we're, we're enabled to take on the big guys, which is sort of the core premise of this, of, of, of this presentation today. And um, they, they managed to grow the online uh, revenue to 25% of their total. So they obviously started as, a, as an offline um, brick and mortar shop and it's interesting because one could argue that this is exactly the type of product where you run into stiff competition by the big retailers. I mean, they sell bathroom um, uh, outfitting, basically faucets and toilets and, and, and stuff. So um, this is where um, it gets interesting. Uh, so we're going to dive into a few of these um, studies. By the way, can you still hear me? Because it's sort of cutting on and off. Good. All right. So what's unique about these guys? And um, I think we should ask the question for all of us as consumers, why do we like the small guys? Because I think all of us are kind of have a certain sympathy. If we have the preference, if given other factors, we, we like to shop at, at these small retailers. But why is that? So here are a few sort of um, uh, is a short summary of, of our view, um, what they're good at and why we like them so much is their passion and creativity. I think that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, here's one example. Um, 
Uh, this is a shop that only sells these espadrillas, the Spanish summer shoes. Colorful, and that's all they do. Um, if you look at the, the example that I gave earlier of the lady that sells, uh, that hand makes uh, tango dresses and salsa dresses, that's all about passion. Um, if, you, um, if you look at the next point, it's their knowledge of the market. It's their sort of expertise in what they do, which is closely linked to this passion because, you know, if you're passionate, you're going to, th this, this is your life. And um, here's an, uh, one of the best examples that we have. Here's a merchant from Hamburg. So it's a German guy who's married to a Georgian lady. And um, it turns out, and this is uh, something I didn't know, but it turns out that Georgia is sort of the cradle of wine or wine culture way before the Romans and Italians. So through his personal sort of connection, um, he was exposed to this and he became an importer of Georgian wine in Germany. And, um, and then by extension, he started importing delicacies. Then he started an, an offline shop so you can go and, and visit him in, in, in Hamburg. So this is a great example of how powerful expertise is because you can actually go to a shop and sort of, you know, talk wine, talk. This guy is like, like an encyclopedia on wine. So um, this is, I think, a, an excellent example of this. Uh, extraordinary products. Yeah, I think we already saw a couple couple examples. So the opposite of sort of commoditized products, products that are um, unique, but also uh, where you can um, uh, 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 that you can uh, market emotionally, so to speak. So here's yet another great example. This gentleman um, at the bottom left, Oke Hams, is actually the uh, <laughs> the world champion in uh, in um, table football or as we called it in Canada, foosball, um, or um, in English, yeah, table football, I guess. And um, so what he does is he sells these um, tournament quality uh, uh, tables. And he also sells accessories, and he also se sells uh, training sessions. And um, the, the thing about this, so we, we actually bought a table for, from him for the office, and then we designed his shop. And what's, what, what was interesting when we talked to him is that he didn't even mention anywhere on his website that he was the world champion in table football. And we told him, well, uh, you know, don't you want to put this on your, uh, on your website? Don't you want to let the world know? Because there's no better way to, to achieve sort of differentiation and loyalty and, you know, retain customers. No, no better way than to convey that this is your life. And there's probably you're the undisputed authority on the subject. So... Sorry, move, moving on. Final point about these um, uh, unique points. Obviously, local presence, but you could argue, you know, large retailers also have a local presence. Um, but what's interesting here, and we're going to get to this in a second, is the sort of the omni-channel aspect. And this is where the, where the small guys are really have a, a bit of an advantage over the big guys, is because the, in the shop itself, in the physical shop, this is where all of this magic happens, right? This is where you can convey your passion, you can convey your expertise, you can convey your um, uniqueness most effectively. Of course, you can do it online as well, which we're going to cover in a second. But this is kind of the, the hub. And if you look, um, so this is another example. Um, they sell. Um, they sell motorcycle equipment online, helmets, jackets, goggles, that sort of stuff. They started online, another example from Hamburg, and then they opened their shop. And this is the one that you see in the background is their shop. So this kind of becomes this, if you think of this, you know, what Harley Davidson did in the 80s with their rider club. This is kind of like the local, local version of it where all the guys come to to, to talk, talk motorcycles, talk about their passion. And this is the strength of SMBs because you can do this and you don't have to have large marketing departments to do this for you. So, and final point is real humans with a story to tell, which you've sort of identified in, in all of these examples, but this is probably the best one. This is Dani. She, um, she comes from a baker's family and she makes these cake pops and what's cool about this, she does it in the family bakery. And she made a B2B business out of this. So you can actually get custom cake pops 
for company events. And this is what we did at ePage, is we actually purchased from her for our trade show appearances, and you can get your company logo and whatnot. But also you can order it for weddings and that sort of stuff. And the cool thing about this is that Dani is the brand. If you look at her um, social media presence, this is, you know, you see pictures of, of herself, of her um, husband, their little boy, you know, the story of how this all came about. So this is, this is very easy for her because it's natural, it's real. And uh, I like the slogan, the slogan here in German, Guter Kuchen, Gute Leute, great cake, great people. Um, sort of sums it up nicely. Now switching gears to, <coughs> um, to the perspective of the SMB themselves, of the sm small merchant. This is a study by uh, Manta, which you can, uh, I can give you the details later on, you can find it online. This was pretty revealing to us when we first saw it, um, is that if you look at the motivators, if you look at what the respondents said, you look at this 4% monetary benefits, only 4% of the respondents said this is the, this is the real reason why I'm doing this. Obviously everybody wants to make money, but you know, these people do it for independence, reasons and to be uh, to be their own boss so this means the independence the freedom to do whatever i feel like doing to to pursue my dream to do to 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 um to do what i'm passionate about and this is something that i think is very very important for all of us that are service providers that offer products and services to small businesses to understand because often we're guilty of sort of corporate jargon of you know thinking in technical terms so this is, this is a key slide. Um, the challenge is um, another study by, by the same company. So obviously number one, oh, the, the numbers are uh, not appearing, but the top left was 29%. So it's lack of capital, no surprise there. You know, if you're a one-man show, two-man show, you don't have enough money. The second one, competition, okay, you could say, well, you know, everybody has competition. But what's unique here is that you also have the big guys as your competitors, the Amazons of the world. And you know, sometimes it's an unfair competition because they beat you on price and they beat you maybe on, on processes and um, um, other aspects. And then, um, so that was I think 17% and the, the third one was 16%. Lack of good help, which basically means you know, I'm small, I'm a one man show, I'm a jack of all trades, so I, I can't cover it all. So these and, and the other ones are sort of less important for this for this discussion. So putting all of this together, so what what are the success factors? Um, if you're a small business yourself or if you're a service provider, what do we what are the takeaways? So I'll, I'll just put the four sort of bullet points that summarize this um, from our perspective. So I'll start with omnichannel. Omnichannel is, I think, we, we would all agree that it's set, that this is not a trend that's just going to pass. It's something that's present, and it's something that applies to both small and large retailers alike. And the reason it's not a trend and why it needs to be taken seriously is because it's an expectation from the consumers on the retailers. And um, in specifically for small businesses, I'll give you sort of the typical use case that you're all familiar with. You know, we all sit, sit down on our sofa after work and pull out our, our mobile device and not our laptop. We typically, you know, use a smartphone or a, or a tablet at home and we browse, we, we shop online. And then the advantage of an SMB is that while you're browsing online, you see that the guy is local and you think, oh, maybe on, on you know, the next day on the way from work, I'm just gonna drop by his, his, his shop and I'm gonna touch and feel the product before I commit, try it on for size, and I'm gonna get it immediately if I like it. So that's, that's the sort of immediate advantage. Another aspect to mobile would be, um, you know, the use case, the typical, you're walking around town and you've, you spontaneously wanna get some, I don't know, motorcycle equipment. And, um, and then you pull up, pull up your device and, you Google and you realize that, or yeah, I guess Google or any other local listing, and you realize the guy's, I don't know, 10 minutes away. So this is how these factors play to uh, 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 work together. Now, 
you know, adding storytelling to this is that component that we just analyzed with the, with the case studies is that, you know, once these guys come to your shop, you have this incredible advantage of conveying your passion, your expertise, and your uniqueness. Now, which brings us to the final point, the marketplaces. So marketplaces and storytelling kind of work hand, hand in hand. They're kind of complement each other in, in, in certain ways. So obviously as a small business, uh, there's no better way to generate traffic if you're unknown than marketplaces, arguable, you know? But it's, it's certainly one way. The, the downside of it, it's not, it doesn't let you convey your emotion. Um, so, you know, this is where the storytelling component comes in. So this is all about retention, about repeat business. And say an online shop is the platform where you can develop this um, storytelling component, this emotional sales pitch in the online world. And uh, in the hello, no, can you hear me? Good. Storytelling, by the way, continues, and it's not just to the to the online shop itself. But you know, if you think back to the example of the of the baker of Dani with her cake pops, you know, her social, social commerce, her social media presence um, is another sort of storytelling component in the, in the online world. And the ultimate storytelling component is when they're actually in your, in your shop. So the point here, the summary of this slide is that small businesses have an innate advantage over large retailers because we kind of all, for ethical reasons, kind of like the small guys. But the, the, unfortunately, the small guys need to deliver on these expectations of, a, say, contemporary, modern consumer like all of us. They need to kind of, these are kind of hygiene factors, if you will. So if I'm not, if you, if you can't find me on, on, your, on, on the mobile device or if, if I'm not on marketplaces or if I'm not doing omnichannel, then I'm kind of given, a, given away this, this chance and then I'm basically reduced to a commodity. I have to fight just based on price and it doesn't work. So the other way around, you know, by doing these things, you can actually justify s s selling value because people enjoy coming to a nice place where the service is right and all these components match. So again, pointing at the wrong device. So this, you know, I'll cover them quickly one by one. This is just a summary of what I just said, except from the perspective of what do all of us as service providers need to provide in our products and services to the small retailers to make them successful, to make them reach their goals. So we all need to keep it simple. This means obvious low cost. If you remember, the number one, 25% is, uh, sorry, not driver um, challenge, is the lack of a, of a budget. But more importantly, it needs to be easy to use. And there's this cliche, easy to choose, easy to use. So the offer, when you communicate to them, needs to be clear and not, not confusing. And it, the product needs to be clear. And um, this, this point here about being fully um, the, the merchant needs to be in control. Because if you think about their motivators, they said, I want to be in control. This is, I, I run my own business. So this DIY component, do-it-yourself component is pretty important. You need to let them focus on their passion. So there were tons of examples that I gave. Here's another one, another boutique uh, in Hamburg. You know, if you start talking to this lady about SSL certificates, application management, and uh, all the other good stuff, dedicated hosting and whatnot, you're going to lose her after probably half a sentence. So you need to make sure that you do the dirty work. Whatever business you're in, it's doesn't have to be online shops if you're a service provider. You need to let them be unique. So what this means is you need to enable them to convey their passion and to convey this emotional product pitch. Here's just an example, you know, what we can do on the online shop side, provide nice templates. We, we launched the theme store uh, recently and this is an example that I picked because I remember this shop on the old template. It was like night and day. And they're in this business of beauty. So this is a, a vehicle to, to convey this sort of emotional um, product. You need to, or we all need to, enable them to reach their, 
their dreams, so to speak. If you look, if you go back to that, to the motivators, why they do this, it's all about independence. It's all about doing the stuff that they love. They're in pursuit of their dreams. So you need to, and, and if you combine this with this other motivator, I want to be in control of what I do, put these two things together, and um, you need to sort of enable them. And that's put the word enable there, as opposed to just do it for them. So you need to kind of get them to the stage where you're, um, this is based on our experience, to get them to the stage where they're sort of self-sufficient, that they can manage, in this case, the online shop or whatever app you're, um, uh, you're providing. So here's some examples in ePages Academy that we run around, I think there's 50 dates this year, so we go around Europe with our in-house experts, but we also partner with our partners like PayPal and Trusted Shops and, um, and have one-on-one -on -one sessions and presentations with our customers. And here's a, a sequence of webinars on the topic of how to use an online shop, what to do with it. And this was interesting. You can, this was done by our employees. So this is just from the marketing department. And um, the nice thing here is that they talk in human terms, not in sort of tech jargon and APIs and, as I said, SSL sell certificates and all the other stuff. And the final point is whatever you provide, you need to, whatever product or service, Going back to these ambitions that they have, these ambitions of making it, you know, pursuing their dream or attaining their dream, they need to start small, but you need to be with them and you need to provide your product or service, sort of guide them all along as they grow. And also, you need to, you need to enable them to sort of ex expand on the product that you give them. So, for example, just here we launch an app store and we're opening the ePages ecosystem to, to partnerships like that because that's, you know, we can, we can cover m way more use cases with partners than we can alone. And um, this is the final slide. I also have a two-minute video that I'd like to, sh to show to you because it covers uh, a few of these examples so you can see what they're like. I'd like to conclude with this nice marketing tagline that we have, your idea, our technology. And I think this applies to most of us or all of us in the audience that are service providers. Let them have their idea. You do the dirty work. You cover the technology. And I, I think if you deliver on this promise, uh, good things can happen. So thank you for your attention. And I hope uh, for those of you that are small businesses here that you maybe found a couple of tricks. And for those of you that are service providers that you identified yourselves with a few of these things, thank you for your attention.
Marjan, thank you very much for the presentation. We have uh, some time for uh, Q&A. So are there any questions from the audience? No questions from the audience. Maybe you have some questions to the audience. That's right, I think I did. Um, does anybody actually know the numbers of the uh, SMB market share for e-commerce? No? Can you, can you hear me in the back? Okay. Does, any of, does anybody know the numbers, the market share of four SMBs in the larger e-commerce market? Because they're really difficult to, to find. Uh, we, we try to find them. We've been trying to find them over the years. Maybe some guesses. Well, if I would say it's definitely less than 50 percent, you know, less than the 45 percent that Amazon posted. Uh, so, but I'd put them anywhere between 20 and 40 percent. I would say. Okay. Uh, last chance to uh, ask a couple of questions, if you have any. Oh, here's a question. So, please do me a favor. Introduce yourself very briefly. Uh, hello. My name is Felipe, I'm from Brazil, and in Brazil we don't really know ePages, and I would like to ask you a tech question. Uh, how free are the users to introduce some own analytics, some other plugins, or even Facebook login, or something like that? Could you explain like a, a bit more about the tech side of, of your solution? Sure. Sure. I mean, uh, if, if I don't cover the, the question uh, well, then uh, here are product managers that certainly can. They're hiding. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we, <clears throat> so we are a proprietary software. So we're different from open source. And uh, so we have our core ePages, um, our core ePages software, the code base. And um, there's certain sort of customizations, or I should say, yeah, customizations you can do on the design level. On the product level, like if you want to integrate certain things, there are a few different ways. So one of, one of the ways that I mentioned was the App Store. But then you have to become a certified developer. You have to develop against their REST API. And then you get published in the App Store. Uh, so we have a lot of partners in sort of social media apps and that sort of stuff. We also have a a Facebook integration that we built ourselves, but you know you can do other stuff through the API. Uh, there's things that. Um, what else, Malta? What what else am I missing here? Um, okay. Yeah, we can feel free to come to us and um, chat after the session. Okay, I saw another cautiously rising hand. Are there any other questions? Someone else had a question, I think? No? Okay, so thank you very much. And um, thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.